Now uh, looking forward to getting into God's Word together. Studying the book of Ephesians. Okay? And uh, so we're in chapter 2. And uh, we're going to start there uh, tonight. Okay, let's pray. And, and then we'll, uh, we'll start thinking about God's Word. Okay? Uh, Tim, why don't you leave us to prayer? Will do. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everybody that could be here tonight. And we pray for those that uh, just couldn't make it. We pray that our eyes and our hearts are open to hear the word and may we receive something that that uh, we may learn tonight. And then we may carry that out, Lord, in anything we do or say, that we may glorify your name and your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Okay, well, I want you to think with me about walls tonight. Okay, we're going to talk about walls uh, for a while. And, uh, you know, when uh, Adam and Eve sinned against God, there was a wall that was built, wasn't there? So to speak. A separation of God from man. A separation of relationship, of fellowship, because man sinned against God. Yeah. Now, we know that by the grace of God, that wall has been torn down. Amen. Uh, to those who believe, to those who surrender their hearts and lives to Christ, that, that wall of separation that was once there because Christ died for our sins, has been taken away. And now, we can have fellowship with God once again. Amen. Okay? But that wall exists and existed. Um, in the Old Testament, I want you to think with me, because uh, when the children of Israel left the land of Egypt... Okay, God instructed them to build a tabernacle. Okay? And that tabernacle was very interesting. It sat in the middle of the camp, and around the uh, tabernacle, there was a white fence. And it surrounded, and the children of Israel would camp, and they were assigned where they were to camp. And they were to camp in the tribe of Levi was here up. There was the east. And they were here on the east. And then the different tribes were each given a place where when they stopped uh, to set up camp, the tabernacle would be in the middle of the camp and the different tribes would be around the camp. The tabernacle was um, <clears throat> distinguished by the fact that it only had one door. Okay, and only the Levites, only the only the priest could enter that door. Uh, and there, there, there would be an altar, and then there was a a, a laver of water, and then there would be what was called uh, the tabernacle proper. And the tabernacle proper was made up of two rooms. Okay, there was the what was called the holy place, and then the holy of holies. Okay, but there was walls of separation. Only the priest could come in to make the sacrifices there. The people had to stay outside. The priest could come in, but only the high priest could enter into this area here, the holy uh, place and the holiest of all, as it was uh, referred to in, in Scripture, the holy of holies. And only the high priest could go in and he could, uh, uh, there was a curtain that separated the two rooms. Okay? And only the high priest could go in there. And, and there on the, uh, the uh, Ark of the Covenant was a mercy seat. And there on the mercy seat, there were two angels that hovered over it. And that, that's where the high priest would take the blood and he would apply the blood to the mercy seat. And if he had done everything according to the scripture, then God would accept his sacrifice and the Bible says the glory of the Lord would fill the temple. Okay, would fill the tabernacle. But if he did not, 
do as he had been instructed, then he would be put to death. And there, it was interesting because uh, in the priestly garments, around the bottom of the priestly garments, there was a bell, a, a, a kind of a border. Okay, and the border had a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, a bell. And so the people that were outside and the people who were in the courtyard, the priests who were in the courtyard and everything, they could hear the priests going into the holy place. They could hear him go to the to the lampstand. They could hear him go to the table. They could hear him as he would walk to the altar of incense. They could hear as he would go into the uh, uh, holy holy of holies. And they loved that sound. What they did not love is if they heard him fall. Because they knew at that point God had struck him dead because he had not followed the proper procedure to get to the mercy seat. And so, also in the priestly garments, there were some very long, uh, a very long belt, if I could use that terminology, to that would go outside. So that if he were struck dead in the holy uh, in, in the holy place or the holy of holies, then they could pull him out without endangering themselves. Now, God is holy. And, and the fence even that surrounded the tabernacle spoke of God's holiness. And the sinfulness of man can't mix with the holiness of God. And so there was a barrier there. There was a barrier. Later on, Solomon would build a temple. And in that temple, there would be different courtyards. Okay? And, in, and there would be the temple itself and where rested the Ark of the Covenant and there was a large veil uh, that covered that, once again, that holy of holy places. And there was the holy place... But then outside the, te the uh, temple, not the tabernacle, but outside the temple, there were some courtyards. And one was called the courtyard of the Jews. And anyone who was a Jew could come into the temple area and they could go, go to that area and so forth. Now the priests and so forth, they would be serving and so forth. They, would, they could go into the temple itself. They could go into the whole, uh, uh, once again, the high priest could go into the uh, holy place and into the holy of holies and so forth. But only the Jews could go. There was another. There was another courtyard, the courtyard of the Gentiles, and the courtyard of the Gentiles was separated from the courtyard of the Jews by a wall, because it was against the law for the Gentiles to go any farther then that, that wall allowed them to go. And to go farther than that would, to be, would be to incur penalty. Okay? And that penalty could be death. So you've got out here, you've got, you, you've got the, the walls of the temple, and most people are out there, and then, but you've got the Gentiles, and there's a courtyard for them, so they can get a little closer to God, but not right to God. And then there was the Jews, the courtyard of the Jews, and and they could come so close, and then there was the priest once again, and they could go into the temple, and they could go into the holy place, but they could only go so far. And then there was the veil, another barrier, and only the high priest could go beyond the veil. Barrier after barrier after barrier after barrier. And when Christ died on the cross, one of the unique statements in all of Scripture is this. And the veil of the temple was torn, was torn in two. From where? Top down. From the top to the bottom. Not from the bottom to the top. It wasn't man who in instigated this. It was God. From the top to the bottom, 
the, the veil was rent in two and it signified that now all men could come and could worship God freely and could know Him and have a relationship with Him. But in the hearts of men, they had to believe by faith, didn't they? That what Christ has, had done was sufficient because it was sufficient. Only He could bridge the gap, tear down the wall, if I could say, in order for us to have fellowship with God once again. Only God could do that. Only Christ could do that. And we've been studying that in the book of Ephesians. Okay? And you were dead in trespasses and sin. But God, who is rich in mercy, because He loved us, He saved us by His grace. He made, he made the way whereby we might have fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. Not by our own good works, not by our deeds, not by how much we know or how much we have or what position we may have attained to. I mean, we weren't like the high priest. I mean, the high priest, everybody respected the high priest. Everybody respected the priest. And you go on down and you get down here, didn't it? No. But he was the man who lived outside the walls could now have fellowship with Christ. Okay? Could have fellowship with God because of what Jesus Christ did. And so we come to Ephesians chapter 2 and we look at verse 8 and it kind of sums up, well, let's look at, I think we want to start a little bit before verse 8. Okay? Ephesians chapter 2 Let's see where we're at. My thumb's not working very good. Okay, here we go. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, okay, hey, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We walked according to the course of this world. We were enslaved. To sin. The Bible says that we were dead. Okay, we had no life. We had no, excuse me, we had no spiritual life. We had no capacity within ourselves to bring ourselves to life. But God, it says, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, what did, he do? what did He do? He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And He raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are, if we have surrendered our lives to Christ, okay, if we have received this forgiveness of sin, if we have received this new life, in Christ, then we are in a we live in a different realm. We live in a new realm. We live in the heavenly places, and we are in Christ. And the the the, the major prepositional phrase, if I could use that term uh, for those of you who are teachers, uh, in this chapters one and two is in Christ. We are in Christ. Okay. Not only that, but we find out as we study Scripture, He is in us. So that in the ages to come, verse 7, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Every blessing that we have, every kindness that we receive from God is because of Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Hey, 
It's not something we did. Hey, if we did that, if we did that, we earned our salvation. If we could earn our salvation, well, look at me, I'm a pretty good guy. No. The truth of the matter is, you were dead. I was dead in trespasses and sins. There's no getting around that. But God did something that I could not do for myself. And he saved me by his grace. Not, and he didn't look at me and say, well, look, 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 at, look at Jack Clay. Look, well, well, he's, he's uh, uh, I don't know what he would be. Uh, he's, uh, <laughs> he's just a pretty decent guy. <laughs> he is a pitiful case. Yes, he is. Oh, uh, maybe he's got, he's got uh, a lot of uh, influence, or maybe he's got uh, a position that people, you know, he's done this, or or he's achieved this in life, or he's he's done this good work, or he's done this good deed, or, he, or he's helped these people. Those are all good things. But you know what? I was dead in trespasses and sins, and it's because of God's grace that I have been made alive. Amen. And then look at it, okay? Because we, a lot of times we stop at verse 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. What? For we are his workmanship. Okay? God created, it's just like, uh, and I think I used the, the uh, picture uh, or the illustration, and we are his masterpiece. Okay? He is working and moving in our lives to create a picture of Christ that others can see and be drawn to Him. Not a picture of ourselves that others can look at us and say, oh my, what a good person He is. Oh my, what, a, what good things He does. Or oh my, look at what He's achieved. No, that's not why we are His workmanship. That's not why Philippians says He... He is working us both the will and to do of His good pleasure. He is creating a masterpiece in us so that we might reflect, so that we might show His glory. Okay? He does it to glorify Himself. Look at Psalm. Let's go to Psalm 68. If that's not it, we'll look at another one. Okay? <laughs> I think it's Psalm 68. I... No, it's not 68. Okay. It's 67. Okay. I love this song. This is one of my favorite songs. Okay. Look at verse 1. God be gracious to us. God show us grace. And bless us and cause your face to shine upon us. Why? that your way may be known on the earth and your salvation among all the nations. Why do we experience the salvation of God? So that we might reflect and so that we might make known His salvation. To whom? To the world. To all nations. Oh, wait a second. Now I'm thinking in the temple. Not just the high priest. Not just the priest. Not just the Jews. Even the Gentiles can go all the way into God's presence. We'll look at that in just a little bit in Hebrews. Okay? Side note. Uh... One of the reasons that I have loved watching OU softball, in fact, maybe the only reason I've loved watching OU softball, because it, you know, it's, it's softball. <laughs> uh, but you know what? Just keep going. Those girls give glory to God. That's right. For what they do, and their coach has shared Christ with many of them, and many of them have come to know Him because of that. Amen. Okay. And, uh, and I think that's tremendous. Now I do, like, my dad played fast, fast pitch softball, but I've also seen a lot of people with uh, broken jaws, cheekbones, so forth, as a result of it. So I didn't grow up a big fan. But I did, I played softball myself. I just won fast pitch. 
Okay, uh, I wasn't going to put my life in harm's way like uh, Alyssa, what's her name, Brito mm -hmm. does, mm -hmm. playing third base in fast pitch softball. I've seen too many people's faces literally smash. Mm -hmm. My dad played it, and he was a catcher. So, yeah. Okay, that's like I said, that's sign of, but look, but why did they? I, I remember one year they won the championship. And they sang that song that says, uh, "The world's going to forget about me, but I want them to remember Jesus." And that was the t that was the gist of the song. Mm. Oh. See, the world may forget about us, yeah. but what do we want them to remember? What do I want my grandkids to remember? What do I want my kids to remember? I want them to remember that God loves them and that Jesus died for them, and that He offers them a life, eternal life forever with Him. And that they can, they can, in spite of the trials of life, they can live with the presence of God guiding them and, and providing for them and protecting them. Okay? That the world may know who He is. The world's going to forget me. But that the world may know who he is, and, and I am his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. What, what, does, uh, what did Jesus he said? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your what? Your good works and do what? Glorify your Father who is in heaven. It wasn't a means of gaining the favor of God. I'm dead in my sin. I can't gain God's favor. But He can make me alive. He can save me. He can redeem me. He can restore me. And I can be used by Him to share His love with other people. Amen. That, that they might know who He is. And they might be drawn to Him. Yeah. Okay, we are His workmanship. masterpiece. His workmanship. Okay. All right, but that's not really the lesson tonight, okay? <laughs> We're getting there. Let's get to the last part of chapter two. Therefore, remember. Now, let's remember who he's talking to. He's talking to Ephesian believers, most of whom, if not almost all, are what? Jews or Gentiles? Jews. Gentiles. Gentiles. Oh, there? <laughs> okay. Ephesus was a Gentile city. Okay? And Paul would always go and share with the I Jews know, first. You know, that was his pattern. Okay? But Paul became known as the apostle to the Gentiles. That's right. And so he's speaking here to Gentiles and he says, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, in other words, you weren't a Jew, you were a Gentile, who are called the uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision. In other words, that's what you were referred to by, by the Jews. You, you were the uncircumcised, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you at that time were separate from Christ. He's calling them to remember what they were like before they came to know Christ. They were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. They were, what was Israel known as? They were known as the people of God. And he said, hey, you were not associated with the people of God, even from an earthly standpoint. You were strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That, he reminded them of what they were before they came to know Christ. Okay? No hope. But how do you describe a person without Christ? Hopeless. Hopeless. They're hopeless. They're without God. The promises of God are not being claimed by them. They're not for them. 
The promise of eternal life is not for the person who rejects Christ. It's for those who receive Christ. Those who believe on Him. <coughs> hmm. But look, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly were far off, now have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's you and I, by the way, unless you're a Jew here, okay? If you're a Gentile like I am, okay, anyone who's not a Jew is a Gentile, okay, was referred to as a Gentile. Hey, we have been, we can access the presence of God because of the blood of Christ. Okay? For he himself is our peace. There was enmity. There was a wall of separation between us and God. But Christ, because he shed his blood for us, for our sins, he has made peace with God. We have peace. What does the Bible say? Therefore, being justified by faith, Romans 5.1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there's an old uh, uh, billboard, okay, that I used to see. I don't see it very much anymore. And it says, No Christ, K N O W, no Christ, K N O W, peace, mm -hmm. no peace. No but then below it, it says, No Christ, N O Christ. No peace. Yep. Okay? So that puts it very simply. He is our peace. He has broken down the walls. A partition between us and God. But not only that, between us and our Jewish believers, our Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ. Look at this. For He Himself is our peace who made both groups into one. And broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Okay, what's your, what wall is he return, referring to now? If you're talking about the temple, he's talking about that wall that separated the Gentiles from the Jews. And the Gentiles can only come so close, and the Jews could go a little bit farther. But now he's saying, hey, that wall's been broken down, and you're all one now. And not only that, you can go all the way to the presence of the Father through Jesus Christ who shed his blood for you. He has broken down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away. Okay? Thank the temple. Who was farthest away? Gentiles. And those who were near. Doesn't matter. There is no difference now. Because of Christ, there is no difference. All those who are in Christ, there is no difference. Jew, Gentile alike. By the way, while we're while we're here, let's let's go over to Hebrews chapter ten. Okay, and let's talk about this path to God. If I could use that terminology. Okay, in Hebrews chapter ten. In verse 19. Now, Hebrews was it written to Jewish people. Some of those Jewish people were believers. But some of those Jewish people were not believers. Okay? They had not embraced Christ yet. They had heard about Christ and they had been taught by Paul and others that he was the fulfillment of the law. Okay? But they had not embraced him as the fulfillment of the law. They had not embraced Him as their Messiah. 
And so he comes here and he says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Now, that, there's a lot that comes before that verse. Okay? Ten chapters plus. But we have confidence. To, and now he's talking. Where are we going? We're going to the holy place. How do we get there? Through the blood of Jesus. Through our own works? No. Through our rituals? No. Through our status? No. Through the blood of Jesus? Yes, by a new and living way, it says, which He inaugurated for us through the veil. That is His flesh. And since, okay, so the veil that was there, okay, what, what brought down the veil? Christ did. Why? Because He was that veil that, that they couldn't quite see. That it was Christ. And when He gave His life, the veil was torn from the top to the bottom. Okay? And now there was a new way by the blood of Christ. In fact, in the Old Testament, in the tabernacle, when the priest would carry the blood from the altar and he'd go to the laver of water and go to the holy place, they call that the blood sprinkled way because as he would go, the drops of blood would go all the way to the mercy seat. By a new and living way which he has consecrated us for us through is through the veil that is to say his flesh. And since we have a great high priest of the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to spur one another on to love and good works. Unknown caller. <laughs> Sorry. Trying new things. Okay. Christ broke down every barrier between us and God. And not only that, Christ broke down every barrier, but we don't see it. But we, we need to... He broke down every barrier between believers. We are one in Christ. That's the, that's the message of the last part of Ephesians 2. One of the... You know, we talk about a lot of the great blessings of, um, of being in Christ. You know, we, we've been chosen by God and we've been adopted and we've been, you know... Uh, uh, we've been uh, forgiven and we've been uh, given the Holy Spirit and, and we've, we've been made an, an inheritance and we have an inheritance in, in Him and so forth. And we who were dead were made alive. Okay, We were saved by His grace and we look, and we look at all these things and it's because of Christ. It's because of Christ. It's because of Christ. You know one of the great blessings of, of uh, being in Christ that a lot of times I think we miss is that we are in His family. If you're in Christ, I'm your little brother. <laughs> and you're my, you're my sister. You're my brother in Christ. And that is an eternal blessing. An eternal bond. Hey, do we need the body of... Okay, I, I, I use the, the analogy of we are part of a family. We are part of... We call it... Uh, there's another illustration... We are the body of Christ, right? And uh, the the what the the hand can't say to the eye, "I have no need of you," <laughs> right? Or the ear, I, do I have a need for ears? Do I have a need for feet? Do, yeah, I have a need for. I mean, the body. We, we all need it, and it all needs to work together. Okay, in concert and in harmony. One of the greatest blessings that you have by being in Christ is being in His family, being in His body. Yeah. And in Ephesians, he uses another analogy. Verse 18, For through Him, 
we both, talking about Jews and Gentile believers, have our access in one spirit to the Father. God's spirit, if you are his child, God's spirit dwells in you. And if I am his child, God's spirit dwells in me. We have a bond by the spirit of God who lives within us. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. It doesn't matter whether you're Chinese or whether you're African American or whether you're African or whether you're Hispanic or, or, or whether you're a Jew. See? Yeah. Or whether you're English or whether you're Irish or whether you're what are French? Even? If you are in Christ, God's Spirit lives in you. And we are all members of His family. And we are all part of His building. Okay, and here's the analogy. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens. You are fellow citizens. You are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Okay. Look at look. This is Ephesians two nineteen. I'm sorry, we're back there again. We're not strangers anymore. We're not aliens anymore. We're fellow citizens. We belong to the same country, if I could use that terminology. And he says, and you are part of God's household. having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fit together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Oh, wait a second. What was the temple for? Meeting with God. Meeting a place of meeting with God, a place of worship. I want you to think about that because one day the Bible says that every tongue and every tribe and every people and every nation, all of those who are believers in Christ will stand before the throne of God. And what are they going to do? They're going to worship Him. Yeah. Let the people, oh, well, we could go back to Psalm 67. Let the people <coughs> praise you, O oh God. Let all the people praise you. Not just the Jews. Not just the Gentiles. Not just the people from America. Not just the people from South America or from Africa or Australia or Russia. Let all the people Praise you, O oh God. Let all the people praise you. What? That thy way may be known. Thy salvation among the nations. So, that's why I love to meet together with God's people. That's why I love to go to church on Sunday and meet with God's people so that we might worship Him together. I love to worship God by myself. I love spending time alone with God. I need that. But you know what else I need? I need to worship God with others. And I need to serve God with others. God didn't make us to be the Lone Ranger. Okay? And maybe the Lone Ranger with Tonto, we, you know, <laughs> we got one other there, maybe we, no, he wants us to remember that we are part of a household, that we are part of a building. The chief cornerstone, who holds it all together? Who holds it all up? Jesus. Yeah. 
I, and, and I thought about this because he talked about the, the prophets and the, uh, the apostles and prophets. What did Jesus command them? What did he tell them to do? He said this, all power and authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore, and what? Make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. I'm, I'm the cornerstone. I'm the foundation. I'm the one who holds it all together. I'm the one who holds it all up. I'm the head. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay, and lo, what? I'm with you always. Where's God's Spirit right now? He's in my heart. And He is in the hearts of all those who believe in Him. And when we meet together, He is in our midst, isn't He? Okay. And a lot of times, you know, well, the Lord went there. Wait a second. Now, were you there? Does the Holy Spirit live in you? Yeah. Well, does the Holy Spirit live in Tim? Yeah. Does the Holy Spirit live in Diane? Well, the Lord, what's the deal then? We're just not recognizing Him. I don't pray for God, I never pray for God to be with someone if they're a believer. Never. God be with Tim. I don't do that. But I will pray this, God, make your presence known. Because his presence is already with him. Make your presence known to Tim and make your presence known through Tim to others. Yeah. I think that's right. Or maybe I'm wrong. Oh, it's a matter of semantics. No, it's not to me. Because I believe if I am in Christ, that his spirit lives in me at all times. And so if I don't <clears throat> sense his presence, and it's not some kind of woo 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 presence. But if I don't sense it, if I don't huh? <laughs> woo 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 yeah. I knew she was gonna <laughs> do that. It's, it's because it's not something that's just you know, a feeling. Yeah. But I recognize his presence in my life. Then what am I doing? I am believing in him. I am having faith in Him. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that He is. He is who He says He is. And that He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Okay? Can I know what the Lord has for me? Can I know His mind? Can I know His will? Yes, as I seek Him. How, how do I seek Him? By faith. In, in what I do? In my intellect? No. In what Christ has done for me. When He shed His blood on the cross. Okay? Alright. Questions, comments? You know, there's another, when you said that about you don't pray for God to be with Him. There's another phrase that just, I think is just so, such a wrong idea that's popular now. It's, and God showed up. Well, no. We didn't have some kind of special service and God decided to show up. Yeah. I just think that is, it, it's such a wrong thought way to think about it. Well, and what it's based on, it's something that I did mm -hmm. that made him show made up. Made him show up. No. <clears throat> he shows up, if I can use that term right, when he wants to. He makes his presence known when he wants to. And Jesus is in me. Right. So he's so right, right. 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 He wanted to be He's been here right now. Yeah. yeah. So it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Amen. I uh, was made aware of an event that happened in March. Mm -hmm. You may have heard about it. Passion 2024. Mm hmm. I see it was amazing that some people are kind of talking about it. Uh, on this day, he's been sung in this stadium, mm -hmm. and it was just amazing. It's a video on YouTube. It's a, it's a what? 
Passion 2020. Yeah, Passion 2020. Yeah, they have they have a Passion Conference every year. And just, just does God does God inhabit the praises of His people? What does that mean? That means that when His people praise Him, when he, when His people are worshiping, what does He do? He He makes aware that He is in their midst. And how does He do that? He does it by changing lives. He doesn't do it by, yo, know, that felt good. Well, where's the change? Jesus changes lives. Because what does He do? He washes by His blood our sins away from us. As far as the east is from the west, so He separates our sins from us. The sign of God working and moving is changed lives. This new generation, young people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Okay, so this is an old one. I bet you know it. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His love, joined heirs with Jesus as we travel this song. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. Thank you, young people. Thank you, Amen. Next week, chapter three. I have a special request. If you guys would remember mm. Terry Cowan, he's a friend of ours. He's in Baptist Hospital. He's had his arm amputated. He's just having so many struggles. He's got staph infection now. Mm -hmm. and he's very depressed. Um, and he's just a dear friend of ours, and he real, I don't know if he knows the Lord or not, but I was to just pray that he does. God will move in his life and help him, heal him, and get him on his way to recovery. Calvin. Uh-huh. Yes, he really needs our prayers. Amazing work together. Let's just pray for Terry. Lord, I thank you that you are in our midst, and Father, that you hear our prayers. And Father, we just uh, we come to you by the blood of Christ, not by our own merit, but by His blood. And Father, we ask uh, in behalf of uh, Terry. Uh, Lord, who's in Baptist Hospital, and Lord, just pray that, first of all, Lord, that uh, if he doesn't know you as his personal Lord and Savior, yes. that, Lord, you would you would draw him to you, and that you would come into his life, and that you would uh, make him whole and one with you again, Father. Lord, we pray that you might just give him and grant him physical healing. Father, uh, if he does know you, Father, we just, just pray that you do. Make your presence unto him at this time. Amen. Lord, may he be aware that you are with him, that you never leave him, that you never forsake him, Father. Lord, just watch over him, and Lord, just preserve his life, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.